and thank you for joining us for today's webinar featuring Professor Lucy Flesch. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing through geodynamics.org. During the webinar, only the host and the presenter will have their microphones enabled, so use the chat window to type in your questions or to communicate with others. Presentations in the series are approximately 50 minutes in length with questions and answers following during the remaining time. Today's talk by Professor Lucy Flesch continues our series on benchmarking, connecting it to observational data. Lucy received her PhD from Stony Brook University. As a professor at Purdue University, she continues to pursue her interest in the dynamics of plate margins by focusing her research on the kinematics and dynamics of the continental lithosphere, namely the interact interaction between the lithosphere crust and mantle, de deformational driving forces of continental lithosphere, and the development of large plateaus. As her modeling are all observationally based using geodetic, geologic, and seismic data, she has contributed her expertise to a number of organizations, including IRIS, EarthScope, and the Plate Boundary Observatory, by serving on a number of committees on data and cyber infrastructure. Today, Lucy presents her work, which encompasses a number of topics of interest to the CIG community in her talk, Workflows and 3D Ge Geodynamic Simulations of the India-Eurasia Collision Zone. Thank Lucy? It's all yours. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Um, and thank you again uh, for uh, asking me to give this webinar. Um, I would like to just start by acknowledging uh, several people who worked with me in the models that I'm going to be showing today. My colleague, um, Saab Huck, and uh, graduate student, Kevin Costner, my colleague at Montana, um, Rebecca Bendick, and my uh, current PhD student, um, Sarah Bischoff. So let's see. Oh, there we go. So. Um, actually, as uh, Lorraine commented that the picture of uh, Tibet looking at here reminds her of her children's sandbox, we're actually going to start with analog sandbox modeling. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work we've done in uh, uh, modeling both analog and numerical modeling together uh, to learn about um, strain partitioning um, at oblique convergent um, margins. And so um, when you have um, convergence between, say, uh, an oceanic plate, and here we have uh, the overriding plate where you have a four arc develop and, and an accretionary wedge. Um, when you have um, a convergence that is uh, ha at some angle, here we would call that angle theta um, to the margin, what we see is sometimes shear within the, we within the wedge. Um, but we also see a development of a uh, shear zone and a development of a four arc sliver. And so the question uh, relating to this project um, is what are the factors that lead to the development um, of this four arc um, sliver? And let's see, here we go. Sorry, I had forgot to take the slide out. These are um, uh, the analog of the sliver development experiment. So these are actually sandbox models. Um, there are two different models that are shown here. Uh, to the model on your left is a layer rheology. So there's a layer of uh, theraputty um, overriding a layer of sand. And then on your right is simply a layer of sand. So what we have is a friction over viscous model on the left and a frictional, purely frictional model um, on the right. And uh, you can see that there is, uh, let's see, I should step back and say, uh, these are all start um, as a flat surface, and then we have this back wall um, push, and it's given at um, some obliquity. So we've got this, uh, the images are shot uh, normal to uh, the obliquity, and you can see um, the development of shear, or the development of the sliver, um, in uh, the analog experiments. Um, these are at an obliquity um, of uh, 50 degrees. And so what we'd like to do is you see the development of the sliver in uh, the in the um, both the layered and the frictional case. Um, we can identify um, that these occur, but we would like to model this numerically to try to understand and um, identify stresses to really uh, look at the factors that are involved in um, uh, formations of slivers. And so we do this through finite element analysis. And so um, all of the models that I'm going to be talking about today are going to follow um, the same uh, finite element analysis and governing equation. So I'll go through this uh, at the beginning, and then we'll um, use this at different points. So we need our um, governing partial differential equation. Uh, we need to define some discretized boundary, and then we need to apply uh, boundary conditions. 
And so um, we're going to be modeling um, this now as a Newtonian fluid. And uh, we'll assume that everything, at least for this first step, is stationary, uh, incompressible, and we'll use uh, Navier-Stokes um, approximation. And so in this case, we have a dynamic uh, viscosity. Rho is uh, density, and um, P is pressure. And so uh, with, uh, with these finite, el finite, finite element model analysis, uh, we can compute uh, U, which is our uh, velocity, um, as well as uh, the interior pressure. And so we're going to start, as I said, uh, one thing that you need is a discretized geometry, which is actually not something not so easy to do. So um, what we did in terms of uh, looking at the numerical and the analog model was to say, okay, this is, this is a nice place to start to ground truth some of these numerical experiments because we have the, the analog uh, sandbox here. You have the underlying therapeutic or therapy putty uh, down here, and then you have the overriding uh, layer of sand. Um, we have a back wall push, so it's a controlled environment. We know everything that is occurring within the sandbox, and so it's um, a way to really ground truth and uh, benchmark um, the numerical analysis. Um, and so we did a number of different uh, material, or excuse me, different runs. Uh, remember, we're treating the, the sand as a frictional material and we're modeling it as viscous. So we had to go through and uh, determine what is the appropriate uh, viscosity to best reproduce uh, the equations or the results in the sandbox um, with the layered rheology of the theraputty um, over the sand. And so I'm going to show you just the first um, instantaneous uh, results. And the way that we did this was to use the laser scanner to determine, this is a model with um, uh, 10 centimeters of convergence. So we have the back wall uh, push up here in the sandbox. Um, you can see the development of the fold and thrust belts uh, through here. Um, and then we also have uh, the, two, the two layers, which are defined by this boundary right here. And we can use a laser scanner to exactly map out uh, the topography within um, the upper layer. You can clear away the sand. This is, again, at 10 centimeters of convergence. And then you can um, map out using laser scanner uh, to know the exact geometry um, of the boundary between the sand and the putty. Excuse me. <coughs> and so um, we can test and we determined uh, the proper uh, viscosity to use uh, for the sand in the viscous materials in order to uh, reproduce uh, the deformation that we see within the wedge. So um, this is the instantaneous uh, velocities um, at the surface of the model. So you can see we have the pushing back wall and the obliquity comes in uh, right through here. And so you can see um, the, uh, the, the pushing velocity uh, is the same as the back wall until you get to this point, um, and then that extends in uh, this obliquity. We can, uh, again, look at uh, this, um, the comparison between the analog material uh, or modeling on the top and the numerical um, model here shown on the bottom. Um, again, this uh, topography is shown in the numeric model, and that was, um, comes from the laser scanning of uh, this uh, numeric experiment. And what we see in here, black is extension that's measured. Um, in the um, in the the high topography of the wedge, and white is compression in uh, the low lying regions, and we see um, the extension here as blue vectors in the high topography of the wedge, as well as um, compression in the low lying region. And so, by going through and ground truthing um, the numeric models with what we see within the analog models that gave us confidence in which we could start to then um, actually look at time-dependent evolution of uh, the wedge development in which that we can look at stresses within the interior of the wedge and say something about what is responsible for for, our, or for sliver, um, for evolution of a, of a sliver. And so I'm gonna go through um, how we set this up. Um, this again, we're mo exactly modeling uh, the, numer or the analog experiments um, in the sandbox it's a controlled environment where we know um, all of the parameters. So we have a uh, 
bottom domain, which is the Therapeti. We have the top domain, uh, which uh, is our uh, sand or our, um, our numeric uh, viscosity of our layer of a high viscosity. We include um, a gravitational um, body force. We push again from the back wall, and then we have the basal uh, velocity uh, here. And that basal velocity um, is at a given angle for a given obliquity that we'd like to measure. And one of the benefits of uh, doing the numerical models um, of these uh, varying obliquities is that um, at high, we can look at a suite of different um, obliquities uh, very easily where it's not um, as easy to do um, in the actual numeric models. Um, like just to give you a sense of scale, uh, the, the sandbox that we're looking at is three meters wide, 12 meters long, and two and a half, and two and a half uh, centimeters high. We push at a rate of um, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, meters per second. And here's the development, um, uh, the profile of the wedge development um, at different time steps. So here's the cross section of an analog uh, model as it develops. This is an early stage, this is a late stage. And the one thing I, well, I should point out is that um, all of the models that we're looking at are plotted on the cross, oops, cross section uh, line shown here, which is perpendicular to the ob obliquity angle. So if we look at the obliquity that's shown up here, um, in these corners, and we're looking um, along uh, the cross-section uh, line here. And as you can see, for um, given obliquities, uh, the overall shape of the wedge stays the same um, as it evolves, although the shape of the wedge varies from uh, perfect normal uh, collision all the way down to a 70-degree um, obliquity. And so now what we want to do, if we can see the evolution um, and the development of these wedges, we'd like to start to evaluate what is uh, that factors that are responsible for um, sliver initiation. And so we're going to go through and define uh, one factor, and um, that's called this angle here, alpha. And that's the direction of sigma 1 um, relative to the plate normal uh, direction here. So um, if we're at uh, the, the, the thrust component, um, a th a alpha of one would, excuse me, an alpha of zero would mean that you're having perfect um, accommodation of strain um, perpendicular to the margin. A um, alpha of 45 would mean that you're um, perfectly in a, a, a sense of shear, or you've partitioned everything um, into a thrust component and a shear component. And I want to just go, uh, oops, that should be Andersonian uh, theory of faulting, but just to remind you that if we look at the direction of our principal stresses, even though we're looking at a viscous, um, a viscous case, we're not going to develop um, uh, earthquakes or faulting, but we can look at, within the, the viscous case, we can look at the orientation of sigma 1, 2, and 3, and that would tell us if indeed uh, there was a uh, faulting or uh, to occur, what style that would uh, take place. And so just to recall for strike slip faults, we have sigma two, which is in uh, the vertical. And for um, dip slip faults, we have, uh, say for say a thrust fault, we have uh, sigma one in the, in the horizontal and sigma two um, in the horizontal. And so what we're going to do is start to look at this parameter um, alpha here. So this is uh, the direction that sigma one is relative to the relative to the margin. And we can look at this um, for uh, a, several uh, a variety of different obliquities. Um, and so on this case right here, we have uh, the plunge. So this is telling us uh, the, if we have a plunge of uh, zero, uh, that means that uh, sigma one is in the horizontal. We have a plunge of zero down here that tells us sigma two is in the horizontal. And as we transition in alpha directions, uh, starting at 30 degrees all the way up to 45 degrees, we see that the plunge of sigma two changes from being in the horizontal, uh, changes to a plunge of uh, 90 
which now means that sigma 2 is in the vertical. And so um, what we're seeing, um, as we see, at least for sigma 2, is we get into um, higher and higher alpha values. Um, the uh, sigma 2, we transition from uh, a dip-slip style faulting up into a uh, strike-slip faulting. And so we can look at the alpha distributions um, for um, the time steps here. So we, again, we have all the various um, obliquities here. I forgot to mention before, each one of these little lines is a different, uh, is 10 millimeters um, of convergence. So the highest point up here is the full um, 10 centimeters um, of convergence. Um, what we see, which is what is expected, is for a, a fully normal collision, um, alpha values uh, don't rotate. But for um, all models that have a non-zero uh, convergent obliquity, so some type of um, obliquity, um, there's a point where we see um, uh, our alpha value goes from um, over the 45 degrees and we transition from a um, uh, sigma 2 being in the horizontal to sigma 2 being in the vertical. And so what I'm going to show you is this is our uh, cross, this is the line right here in the model and that follows this dotted line um, right here. And so what we're seeing is that all of the alpha values out in front of the wedge, so that would be somewhere uh, within here in front of the wedge, are all close to zero. That means we're in a uh, thrust regime. And as you move back further uh, into the wedge, uh, say uh, just past this dotted line right here, all of the um, deformation then changes from a thrust regime uh, to a strike-slip regime. And this is evidence that we're um, partitioning, uh, thrusting out front, and uh, developing strike slip or shear uh, in the back. And so the question is, what then is driving shear localization? And the beauty of having these numeric models is that we have all of uh, the different factors um, that we can look at. We can uh, look at the orientation of sigma 1, 2, and 3. We can uh, look at, we have topography. We can uh, look at the principal components of stress. So what I have on the top is the principal components of stress. Um, again, uh, red is uh, compressional. We have blue, which is um, extensional. And then we also have uh, shear, the component of uh, shear, parallel shear stress and is the background grid. And you can uh, see that's uh, plotted um, over here. Uh, we have the topographic profile. So that's these black uh, lines. So this is the topographic profile. Again, so this would be out front of the wedge. Uh, this is the, the highest top, top, topographic point of the wedge. Um, then we have our alpha values that we've plotted. And then we can also look at margin normal compressive stress and margin normal shear stress. And we can look at this at different um, time steps as we have convergence within uh, the wedge. So here's 10 centimeters of convergence, 50 centimeters of convergence, and 100 uh, centimeters of convergence. And you see initially you have uh, margin normal compression as well as shearing throughout the entire wedge and as time evolves and you start to grow a little topography you can see that you have margin uh, normal uh, compression oops sorry about that this is the one problem with having a uh, having both of the it's open oops um, as you see we start to develop a localized uh, shear and when you get to a uh, 100 centimeters, we have localized shear here, and our margin normal compression actually dips below zero, and we see um, tension. And that is, correlates with uh, the highest point um, in topography. Uh, we see the same phenomena uh, for um, 70 um, degrees as well. Um, here at 100 centimeters of conversion, you have uh, the shear, uh, localized shear here, and here is the... Um, a point where you uh, go into attentional stresses uh, correlating to the highest uh, topographic point. Um, what's uh, interesting to note that the location of the highest alpha corresponds to the highest topography, but not the highest shear stress. So you can see the shear stress um, is uh, located um, back here. And so uh, to sum up what these um, experience, experiments um, are telling us, is that um, the viscous models of convergent wedges produce distributions 
for favorable slips development. And it, it's independent of uh, convergence ubiquity, which was um, originally one of the hypotheses for why you saw um, sliver, def or sliver initiation. And the interesting thing is that what we see in this is that gravitational collapse of these viscous wedges reorients the stress distribution, and that pushes the deformation front uh, towards compression and higher topography towards simple shear. And so um, when we think about four arc slivers, uh, what's really interesting is there's a topographic um, component to them, that the topographic relaxation is really important um, for sliver development. And why this is interesting is because when you look at purely frictional models, frictional, frictional models don't have uh, re relaxation. They don't have um, gravitational collapse. In order to see any type of gravitational collapse or relaxation, you have to have um, a ductile rheology um, at depth. And so um, what this is telling us is that in order to have a, a, sliver, a sliver initiation, it's not reliant on con, uh, convergence obliquity or pre-existing weakness, but what re it's really implying is that there's uh, a component of the ductile uh, rheology um, at depth. So that was a really um, interesting uh, experience and set of experiments um, in a really nicely controlled environment where we could, um, we could model and develop the workflow um, in something that we knew very well and we could control. Um, so the next step, which I don't have a lot of time to talk about, so I'm going to kind of skip over and move into um, our workflows um, in modeling Asia, is to was a work that I did with my colleague at Montana, Rebecca Bendick, where we sort of took this uh, idea of the numerical model and looking at something that we know and can control really well, just to see what is what are the what is the impact of varying um, uh, rheology as a function of depth in in a region where you had say. Um, high topography um, and a crustal root. And so um, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but it's, you can see that was uh, presented in um, Bendick and Flesh. And so we did a series of thought experiments of um, what can be learned um, and what does uh, different str strengths at different levels tell us about what we can um, measure at the surface. And so now that we've uh, done some uh, numeric modeling in a controlled environment and we have uh, you know, lots of confidence um, going in, it's uh, time to take that big step and start modeling a really a region that is, tons is known about and yet um, we know nothing. So um, if we look at, and what I have plotted here is I think one of my favorite slides because it best um, describes the type of uh, areas that I find most interesting. Uh, we have the symmetry and topography of the surface of the earth in gray, and then we have earthquakes from the past um, uh, I think this is now 30 years, uh, CMT, plus a few historic ones in the western um, US. And what it shows is that for most tectonic plates, there's a nice finite zone of deformation uh, between plates uh, where you can say this is the Pacific plate, this is the Nazca plate, this is the Cocos plate. Um, but if we look at the india eurasia collision zone, that's really not the case. You can see uh, deformation here extends um, thousands um, of kilometers. Where exactly that plate boundary is um, is not is not clear. And uh, if we look even uh, closer, now we have the focal mechanism data. Um, the focal mechanisms tell us that not only is deformation diffuse, um, it's uh, highly spatially complex. We see uh, thrusting, uh, compression, normal to the margin, as well as up here, uh, normal to the Tibetan plateau. Uh, and within uh, the Tian Shan. Uh, and yet in this really highly compressive uh, environment, we have east-west um, extension, which rotates down to north-south and then back to east-west in Yunnan, China, as well as opening um, up here within the Tibetan plateau. And so with the advent of GPS, we can start to model um, how these motions are being accommodated, um, where uh, the majority of uh, the slip is uh, partitioned. And I'm just going to blow up uh, real quick because they're easier to see. If we look just within uh, the Tibetan plateau, this is the area that I'm going to be um, talking about um, today. And what's really fascinating about this is that rotation of tension from east-west to north-south back into east-west in Yunnan, China, is really represented by this phenomenal pattern of uh, GPS and model velocity fields, I should say the GPS 
velocities are shown in blue, model velocity fields um, are shown in black. These are plotted relative to a, a fixed Eurasia reference frame. And then quaternary fault slip rate data is shown in red. And you see this uh, amazing rotation of seismic or GPS uh, velocities around the eastern uh, Himalayan syntaxis. What's really fascinating, I think, um, to me right now is that you also see a rotation, an almost collapse of material off of uh, uh, to the other, to the west, uh, into the Pamir Mountains. And this was um, only recently observed uh, with the recent uh, GPS data of um, Ishik et al. And so I think one of the reasons that's so interesting is if you go from uh, west, where we start to see active continental subduction of Eurasia uh, beneath the Pamir, uh, moving into uh, Tibet, where you have um, both from gravity and uh, uh, seismic studies, um, pretty, uh, pretty well uh, compensated um, high topography with um, a deep crustal root. And yet we see similar uh, behaviors in the dynamics, both a collapse in uh, material falling off uh, the Pamir to the west and collapse in material falling off of uh, Tibet um, to the east. And so um, what we would like to try to do is understand um, what's driving these surface velocities um, and really with the new data that's coming out, um, understand how uh, variations um, in uh, both uh, structure and uh, strength vertically and laterally play in driving um, these surface deformations. And so I wanna just uh, show uh, two previous 3D models of uh, the Tibetan Plateau. Um, so this is from Yang and Liu, uh, where they looked at the growth of topography um, over uh, time here. And then Lechman et al. from 2014, um, again, looking at the evolution of the Tibetan Plateau, um, again, with a very detailed um, rheologic structure. Um, what we're gonna do is slightly different from what these uh, two models have done, where they assumed a rheologic structure and then looked at the evolution um, of Tibet. What we'd like to do is say, what will Tibet look like if we assume various uh, rheologic um, structures? And so now I'll start to get into uh, the workflow and uh, how we actually go about um, doing this. And so um, we start with estimating a surface. So we have a top upper surface layer um, we have, we'll estimate a lower crustal layer as well as a moho layer, and then um, assume some uh, base of the lithosphere um, layer. And I'll get into where all of these uh, come from in a second. Um, we do this in terms of a longitude, the latitude, and elevation. So all of our um, data we input as phi or theta phi and r. And then we convert those into an X, uh, Y, Z coordinate system. Um, we're going to solve these using ComSol uh, multiphysics. And so um, everything that ComSol does is in um, X, Y, Z. Um, uh, we formulate a mesh in um, MATLAB. Um, we're actually looking at several different ways to um, formulate mesh. But what I'm going to show you today was using Delaunay uh, triangulate surfaces, and then we vertically connect the triangles uh, via pipettes. Um, we import uh, that mesh into ComSol um, multiphysics, and then um, we apply our material properties, um, the FEM structure um, and uh, boundary conditions to then solve for um, what is the instantaneous surface response to the set of dynamics that we've um, put into uh, the model. So we'll start with the top of the model. And uh, the top of the model comes from uh, uh, G-TOPO30. So we take the G-TOPO30 data uh, to define the top uh, layer um, of our geometry. And then uh, we take uh, the crust 1.0 uh, crustal model from uh, Gabby Lasky and others uh, to determine uh, the MOHO. So here's the crust 1.0. Uh, MOHO in uh, kilometers from the crust 1.0 model. So if you think about this, and this is um, just a really bad sketch that I have made um, using the PowerPoint uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, free draw, but we have the layer here from crust, um, or excuse me, from G-TOPO30. We have the MOHO layer 
here from CRUSP 1.0, and then uh, we can assign uh, physical properties, both density and uh, dynamic viscosity uh, within this layer. Uh, we'll also have a boundary layer at the base. Um, as I said, we're going to define density as well as uh, dynamic viscosity. So we use the 3D uh, density uh, model um, of CRUST 1.0, although we end up actually having to smooth it a little bit in order to get um, a better fit. And so that gives us um, you know, incorporation of the sediments um, uh, and densities within uh, our entire uh, crustal uh, volume right here. Um, lastly, we have to put a, down a uh, bottom layer, which right now is the base of the lithosphere. For the models that I'm going to be showing you today, we simply took a 100 kilometer uh, thick lithosphere. But um, you know, it definitely within um, the near future, what we'd like to do is start to incorporate uh, a variable uh, th lithospheric thickness and then incorporation of an asthenosphere to allow uh, for that uh, variable lithospheric thickness. So an example of one way to do this, um, this is from An and Shui. Um, this is using heat flow and seismic data to determine uh, the lithospheric thickness um, of uh, India, excuse me, India, Tibet, and um, China. And you can see that uh, th lithospheric thickness is highly variable um, uh, throughout the region. And looking at, um, looking at how that affects uh, what we see at the surface, I think is really fascinating. Um, this is really complex. We're starting with something very simple. So we have just our 100 kilometer thick lithosphere. Um, once we understand that simple system, uh, we want to take the next step and make that base of the lithosphere more complex. Um, we can also incorporate additional structure that's not in uh, crust 1.0 to <coughs> our geometries. So this is a model of Schulte Pectimidol, uh, 2005, looking at receiver functions. And they uh, saw the decolmant um, associated with the subduction um, of the Indian plate. And so we've incorporated um, that within uh, the model. OK, so I've talked about where density comes from, uh, where our geometry comes from. Uh, lastly, we need to start looking at uh, how do we constrain uh, dynamic uh, viscosities within the model. And so uh, we have this uh, detailed, well, a detailed um, field of how the dynamic uh, velocity, velocity varies uh, laterally um, within uh, Tibet and uh, China. And this was determined by using um, estimates of deviatoric stresses from gravitational potential energy as well as uh, relative plate motions, and dividing that, so we have estimates of laterally varying deviatoric stresses, and dividing that by our estimates of uh, strain rates that we've determined from uh, both GPS and um, quaternary fault slip rates. And when we do that, that gives us a lateral varying effective viscosity um, that looks like this. Um, I should step back and say that these are from uh, the deviatoric stresses come from thin sheet models. So we're looking at an effective viscosity that's averaged over um, the thickness of the lithosphere. And so um, again, you can vertically average uh, any distribution of viscosity to get um, the vertical average. This um, how the depth strength is partitioned with depth is non-unique. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at um, can we, how do we partition depth so that the integrate, integral of that partition then gives us uh, back the vertical averages that we have um, from this map. Um, additionally, we can bring in um, other observations. We have uh, the observation in the models of uh, Clark and Royden um, with the incorporation of a weak lower crust. Uh, within Tibet, where material is allowed to uh, flow out into the uh, lower lying regions that have a, a weaker area or are not subject to a strong, say, plug like the Sichuan Basin. Um, if you look at the seismic, uh, seismic um, S wave velocities, uh, surface wave velocities of U et al. 2013, um, you can see that there's a slow uh, mid crustal layer that could be. 
uh, interpreted to be that low, weak lower crust uh, that's uh, flowing here. Um, this is the model of Lewidal 2014, and this is looking at that. I should point out um, this is looking at sort of the in depth profile uh, across through here. We'll move over to eastern Tibet. Here's the model of Lewidal. We're looking at this is the B to B prime cross section, which is B to B prime here. And you can see a zone of uh, lower uh, velocity here. So this low velocity, and, and which is interpreted to be a, a weaker, a lower strength layer, continues from the Tibetan plateau into uh, Yunnan, China. You can see A to A prime here, A to A prime here. And that lower velocity layer um, in through here stops um, when you get to the, the, the Szechuan Basin. And so what we've done um, using sort of those types of uh, seismic uh, results um, as a guide is we've uh, blocked off areas with, um, that have higher strain rates um, that will have a weaker um, lower crustal region. And so anywhere uh, here within this uh, bluer color has a uh, lower crustal uh, viscosity of uh, 10 to the 18. Um, anything within the lighter bluer area has a lower crustal uh, velocity, viscosity of 10 to the 20. And then uh, we assume that um, stable Eurasia, as well as the Indian plate, has uh, a very strong uh, lower crust. Okay, so the, looking at how we go about putting uh, the model together and parameterizing the different layers, we're able to use um, topography, the crust 1.0, um, as well as um, images uh, of uh, lower crustal underplating to help us define um, the geometry or the structure um, of the model. We've used crust 1.0 to help us uh, define uh, the 3D density distribution and then um, we also use, um, I don't have it uh, in here, um, we can also use um, the vertically averaged effect of viscosity to um, then help us uh, place bounds um, when we start to look at viscosity contrast between um, the crust um, and the mantle. Um, once we have all of those, we can run them through our finite element model and determine a dynamic uh, velocity field at the surface of our model and we can compare that to uh, the continuous surface velocity field um, from GPS and quaternary fault slip rate data to assess um, uh, how well the assumptions we made about the partitioning of strength with depth um, are uh, successful or not. If we look at um, the model grid, again, we have an upper crust and a lower crust and then an upper mantle. So this is our, our model grid, and it's on a uh, spherical uh, Earth. We're only looking at one of the, the little spherical cap that covers uh, the Tibetan Plateau. It's uh, 4,984 uh, kilometers in length and 5,560 uh, 5, kilometers uh, in, this, in, in the uh, latitude direction. And then we have um, a 100 kilometer thick lithosphere plus whatever uh, topography um, is generated from, uh, or is put on from the um, G-Topo 30. Um, again, with all of the different uh, mesh elements, it's hard to see, but we do have an upper crust, a lower crust, and a lower mantle layer with, vert within this uh, layer, or mesh. Um, we need to apply our boundary conditions. And so uh, for this case, at least, we're going to have a bottom free slip boundary. So we're assuming that mantle tractions do not play a role in driving uh, deformation. We have a stress-free uh, surface. And then we apply um, velocity boundary conditions um, around the boundary um, of the grid. And these velocity boundary conditions on the vertical boundaries come from uh, the uh, continuous model velocity field uh, interpreted from uh, GPS. We have our body force distribution um, that we're uh, using. Again, and this comes from uh, the densities as a function um, of depth uh, here. And then we have to start um, estimating the partitioning of the vertically averaged effective viscosity field. 
And again, there's an infinite way to distribute strength with depth to come up with the same vertical average. So what I'm going to do is show you three different cases. Um, the silver case, where we have the upper crust, oops, my mouse is too sensitive, uh, the upper crust, which is an order of magnitude weaker than the lower crust, and that's the silver case. We have the blue case, where the upper crust and the uh, lower crust, the mantle, excuse me, are the same strength, and we have a weak uh, lower crust. And then finally, um, the, the weak lower crust is defined the way we uh, partitioned it uh, in the earlier slide. And then we have the red case, where you have the upper crust is uh, an order of magnitude stronger um, than the mantle. And so first we're going to uh, test out um, the, the 3D approach by looking at, say, our 3D thin sheet model. So this would be where we have, uh, take our vertically averaged effective viscosity and we apply it uniformly uh, throughout um, the lithosphere. And then we can compare that to uh, the thin sheet model um, of Flesch et al. Uh, 2001. And so the black vectors are the model of Flesch et al. 2001 thin sheet, and the uh, red vectors are uh, the thin sheet coming from the uniform viscosity uh, profile shown over here. And uh, there, they agree uh, somewhat. Um, there are some variations, but the variations that we're um, looking at, you can see that the uh, the current uh, thin sheet model in red um, is uh, smaller than uh, the, the black velocities from uh, Flesch et al. Uh, 2001. And the main difference with these two thin sheet models is that uh, the viscosity profile that we're using here is um, uh, more spatially variable um, and uh, has more detailed resolution than we had for the 2001 model. We can compare uh, this the uh, thin sheet model uh, dynamic velocities again in red to the kinematic velocities. So what do we actually observe at the surface, which are the black factors? Um, and you can see um, overall they do a fairly uh, good job of uh, predicting um, the velocity field. Although you can see over here in um, eastern Tibet, uh, we, the model does not produce the same uh, dramatic. Uh, wrapping around of uh, velocity vectors that we observe. Interestingly enough, we do not see the same. There's, they, they don't tend to rotate as much as the observed over here in the Pamir either. Um, so now uh, we can uh, go ahead and start to look at well, what happens if we go from the thin sheet model to inputting a weak uh, lower crust. Um, and so this is the result uh, if we input a weak lower crust. Uh, again, the red are the, observe, or the modeled dynamic velocities. The black are the observed kinematic velocities. Um, and if we put in a weak lower crust, what we see is that we increase um, the model velocity field. And what I'm interpreting this to be is that by putting in this uh, weaker lower crust, we're decreasing the overall strength of the plateau, and we're seeing more component of gravitational collapse. These velocities are falling off the plateau at a much higher rate. Um, we can then start to look at what happens if we have uh, a weak upper crust that is an order of magnitude weaker than the mantle, yet still stronger than the lower crust. And you can see just by weakening the upper crust and putting the majority of the strength in uh, the upper mantle, um, the surface then becomes uh, much too weak to maintain uh, the high topography, and you get collapse. Again, these red vectors collapse of uh, material from the high plateau to the low-lying areas. What's interesting, although, is that um, what we see is that we may overpredict predict uh, velocities, but we're starting to finally see the rotation of the velocity vectors that's observed um, in uh, the GPS data. Um, in uh, eastern Tibet. We can look at the case now where we have the upper crust um, is stronger than uh, the, the mantle, and we still have the weak lower crust. And um, in this case, um, with an, a stronger um, upper crust, uh, the push of the Indian plate is actually able to transfer 
um, more of that across the plateau, not a much, as much of that motion is accommodated uh, within the plateau. And you can see that we get very little rotation of uh, velocity vectors um, on either side of the plateau. And we also overpredict um, observed velocities as more of India motion is transmitted um, deeper into Eurasia. So as we look at um, some of these uh, seismic models, one of the questions is, we've got the Indian uh, plate uh, underneath uh, southern Tibet. And this has been uh, hypothesized to be a declement or a shear zone um, and very weak. So what happens if uh, we decouple the Indian plate um, from the overriding uh, Tibet along this shear zone? And so if we do that for, say, the, strong, the case of the upper crust being stronger and the mantle being weaker, what we see is a decrease in the overall um, velocity field. Not as much of that India plate motion is transferred um, into Tibet. And we do a slightly better job of matching the magnitudes of velocities as we come across here. Um, but we still, and we also still get a little bit, we do, I should say, we do get more of a rotation, although not one uh, that matches uh, the surface data along uh, the eastern syntaxis. Um, So finally, we can say, well, what is the effect of um, having uh, large-scale faults um, within the area? So we did one last um, experiment. And so this is this case. And instead of just using um, the lateral variation and effective viscosity, we also incorporated and put um, fine weak zones associated with uh, known mapped faults. So you can see now the viscosities where these strike slip faults um, are located are, are here, and so that further weakens um, the lithosphere. And what we find is that with the incorporation of a weak faults or a weaker zone, we do start to see more of this uh, rotation um, along uh, the eastern syntaxis. And so, uh, really, I mean, this is still um, a lot of work um, in, its, in its infancy. Um, there's a lot of uh, different things that we'd like to model and incorporate. Um, but one thing that sort of comes out firsthand is in order to get the rotation of material around the eastern Himalayan syntaxis, um, we have to have some sort of weak zone. We see it if we make the whole plateau weak, we get the collapse around it. If we put in uh, weak fault zones, uh, say that, um, that are coming through uh, here, that also allows for um, accommodation of this uh, collapse. And so we either need to have um, Eastern Tibet weak in order to reproduce these velocities. But the other question is, does it need to be weak or are we missing some sort, um, are we missing another driving force? And so um, namely, you know, we have the Burma slab uh, that comes through. So here's the rotation of velocities. We have uh, the Burma slab here. Is there something associated with the Burma slab that's um, uh, exciting the dynamics and influencing the rotation of material around? And that's, um, that's a question that we'd like to start to answer. And so um, the next step is to take um, uh, slab contours uh, like we see here and add that onto uh, our uh, geometry. So incorporate these contours uh, in our geometry. Now, if you look, We've got the slab contours here. These go down to, say, uh, 200 uh, kilometers depth, um, 200 to 400, really. That means that we're also going to have to increase uh, the vertical component of our model in order to try to really capture the effect of the Burma slab. Again, uh, we've lo we're looking at a flat uh, lithosphere. There's strong evidence um, that there's topography on the base of the lithosphere. So incorporating the topography by uh, adding um, topography on our basal layer um, is another step that we'd like to try. Um, incorporating tractions associated with mantle flow. There are several different uh, convection models of mantle flow. What with a um, variable uh, lithospheric thickness uh, and uh, some type of flow produced, what does that, what influence does that have 
um, on the surface velocities um, that we model. And so in, in that case, we have here's our lithosphere only. This is what we've, the models I've been showing you previously. We can add on an asthenospheric layer and place um, topography on the lithosphere asthenospheric boundary. And then um, we can apply, I should say here, we can apply, instead of applying uh, boundary conditions along the model, the base of the model, we can then put in uh, basal tractions uh, within at the base of the asthenosphere and look at how varying asthenospheric uh, strength and coupling, how that influences what we see um, at the surface. And so I've used up almost my entire hour. I want to leave some time for discussion. So I guess what we've learned um, so far is that our surface velocities are sensitive to vertical uh, viscosity structure. And simulations with a weak upper crust and lower, weak upper and lower crust are dominated by gravitational collapse and overpredict uh, what we see at the surface, although we are able to reproduce uh, collapse both to the east and to the west, maybe overpredict collapse. Um, simulations with a strong upper crust um, don't allow for enough gravitational collapse and transmit too much of India push. And so we need to require some um, weakening. Um, and strong coupling of the Indian Eurasia plate overpredicts motion across Tibet. So I think all of these sort of simple first order calculations show us is that um, there's no sort of one end member case within Tibet that seems to work. Um, it's very complex and um, these parameters uh, probably vary uh, laterally uh, as well. So I guess I'll stop there and I can look at my chat window and see. I'll put up different different things that we'd like to add to our models and simulations um, as I look for questions. Thank you, Lucy. That was a very, very interesting talk. It, it also was very enlightening to see how to make the connections between the benchmarking work you've done and modeling and, and with the observational data. Um, while we are waiting for some questions, if you have questions, that is, please type, go ahead and type them in the chat window. If you want to try to turn on your microphones, raise your hands and you can um, ask Lucy questions directly. Um, So while we're waiting for some questions, I just want to remind you that our, our next webinar will be on May 14th, and we're going to be switching topics off of our uh, series here on, on benchmarking modeling and talk a little bit more about big data. We're going to have a trio of speakers from um, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, um, Arvind Patarka, Stanley Rufford, and Douglas Dodge, and, and they'll be talking about some large-scale seismic signal analysis they've been performing on their big data machines there. Getting some applause there, Lucy. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a very interesting experience to go through. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering in some of your modeling that you do of the eastern Himalaya, whether there's sort of this chicken of the egg sort of phenomenon going on that is that um, you obviously need a very strong upper crust to sort of indent and to drive some of the um, stuff you're seeing in the Tibetan plateau, but around the corner, um, there are uh, it implies that you either have some, like maybe some strain weakening or some weakening, you know, due to the shear that's being created by the edge of the plate. Yeah. So, uh, so have you ever tried to evolve the model to see that sort of weak a weak zone developing, you know, independent of even of what's happening in Burma? We haven't done that yet, and part of it is I feel like until I understand, have a better understanding of what's going on first order for the instantaneous case. I worry mm -hmm. that any errors sort of lead to, or not errors, or not, you know, not fully understanding the instantaneous will lead to maybe erroneous in, in influences. Um, I had another point and it just uh, slipped my mind. Um, but I think, you know, looking at the evolution is, is an interesting, is an interesting, uh, an interesting next step. I see that there's a question, um, have, have, I, have I ever tried to vary the viscosity of the lower crust? Um, we've done some tests where we see how low we can take the viscosity of the lower crust um, before it just is 
becomes um, what's unphysical. And so 10 to the 18 was the lowest that we could, we could bring it. If we brought it any lower than that, everything would just, it, it couldn't support any of its, the, the, the weight of the plateau and everything just, um, it was more a vertical collapse as this really weak material sort of squirted out as um, toothpaste. Um, and so I think 10 to the 18 was the, the lowest we could get it. You can start to increase that um, lower crustal strength and then um, that brings you closer to um, sort of a thin sheet um, typed model. One thing I think that would be really interesting is to vary um, the viscosity of the lower crust. Um, start looking at, are there reasons that you can vary viscosity of the lower crust laterally um, around the plateau? Um, I think that we have, looking at some of the seismic data, I think we have the zone of weak lower crust is probably too large. We need to start to think about bringing that into um, just uh, looking at, um, say, within Tibet, and are there areas within Yunnan where we'd expect it to flow out? And so, I mean, there's so many parameters that you can start to adjust, it becomes a little overwhelming. It's a very complex region, that's for sure. Makes the Having sandbox that. look really nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like playing in sand. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is, have I ever tried to compare the model predicted stress field with the observed stress field? Um, and that is not something that I have um, tried to do yet, although it, it, we, what we can do is pull um, the, the deviatoric stress field um, at different levels or different depths out and compare it to what we, um, the observed stress field. I think um, what I've been doing this far is that the velocity seem to be so sensitive to different changes that we've been using the velocities to sort of guide us in um, uh, hot and cold, and are we getting close to something that's within um, reason? And so can we use the velocities to place bounds on um, the allowable parameters? And then we can look at, um, we can look at the deviatoric stresses that way. I'm reading the next question. How do you estimate uh, deformation contributed um, by the lower mantle. And so um, I think that really starts to look into uh, the basal tractions. And so um, once we, we can then extend uh, the model down to um, below 100 kilometers um, and attach an asthenosphere, we can then um, have uh, put in velocities at the base of that layer. And that will have uh, those with the assumption that those velocities coming from con mantle convection models will be influenced by the lower mantle. Um, and then that those uh, velocities can then uh, be applied at the base of our, of our asthenosphere, the base of the model, and then can influence um, you know, everywhere, anywhere within the model domain. Um, Costa et al. 2015 is currently in review in G cubed. Um, it's uh, it was a, a, a student um, of mine and uh, Sadhak, my colleague here at, uh, at Purdue, and um, we did a series of uh, numerical models of uh, different um, obliquities in convergence, and then uh, looked at all of the different factors that could lead to partitioning of strain and developing. Slivers, so I hope um, that comes out soon because I think it's a really cool paper. Great, we had a lot of good questions. This has been a great discussion. I remind people that this webinar was recorded, so if you want to go back and look at any of Lucy's uh, other figures and her models, um, that should be available sometime next week. I'll get that posted on um, geodynamics.org. Um, Lucy's typing herself a note, I see. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to answer while you were talking, answer that last question. I can say it out, I can just say it out loud that the role of um, the feedback with surface processes is something that uh, Saad Huck in, at Purdue currently is working on and looking at um, how erosion affects um, uplift and um, how that influences um, the evolution of wedges. So Good. if you're interested you... in that, I encourage you to go to, to Saad's uh, webpage. 
Well, are you incorporating topography in your modeling? You, you showed you know, the, the, the vectors. As I assume they were horizontal rates of, of motion. Yes. Have you looked yes. at the vertical component as well? Um, in, the, in Tibet or in the, the sandbox? Oh, in Tibet. In Tibet, yes. We, we're starting to look at that. And partly it's, um, we're looking at the, the horizontal because that's got the most, um, that's the, that has the most control. And then we start to look at uh, the, the, the vertical and we can compare that with maybe um, where we see uplift and different rates like that. Yeah. So. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This has been a, a great webinar, and um, I look forward to uh, seeing you all next month for our next webinar. Thank, thank you again, you. Lucy.